Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say my guest today is Jeffrey Moore. He's an author, a speaker, and one of the world's most influential advisors to the high tech sector. He's famous for writing the classic Crossing the Chasm. And today we're here to focus in on your latest book, Jeffrey's Own to Win. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I, I've been being human for a while. It's good to be on the show. <laughs> now you get to talk about it in detail. Well, first of all, I mean, thank you for writing both of the books. Crossing the Chasm has been a, a major influence of mine uh, over the years. And then uh, it, was, uh, it was a delight to, to read your, your latest book, uh, Zone to Win. Um, and perhaps we, we could start with the, with the premise for, for the book. You know, what, what, what's it ultimately about? Well, so all of my work has been about sort of how disruptive innovations reshape markets and how businesses need to evolve their strategies and evolve the ways they deal with the market and their customers as it goes through what we call the technology adoption life cycle. And the first book, Crossing the Chasm, was about how a startup could go from kind of nowhere to mainstream success, but they had to cross this chasm from the early adopters who were very much believe what they believe into the mainstream market, which need to have it proved to them, need to see, see success. So that's what that book was about. I've written a number of books in between, but the latest book is, is about the same journey, but from the point of view of an established enterprise, one that already has a big book of business and is trying to catch the next wave as opposed to catching the first wave. And that turns out to be a different challenge. Uh, for a lot of reasons. And so this book is kind of resonating now with large public companies, somewhat the way Crossing the Chasm did with Start. Right. And in the, and in the book, you, you enumerate four zones and you think it's important to distinguish these zones and we need a different strategy depending on the zone we're operating in. Yeah, so what happens is if you're an established enterprise, you have a current book of business, and there are two zones in your company that we uh, that I propose kind of constitute the bulk of the work of that business. One we call the performance zone, which is, as you might imagine, that's where you try to make your financial plan. It's also where you serve your customers. It's where you act with the world. So the people who sell your product, the people who make your product, they're both in, they're in the performance zone. And Every quarter, the financial community will measure how you're doing against the results of those two teams. The productivity zone is all of the cost centers that work behind the scenes to support the performance zone. So it's all of marketing, it's all of finance, it's all of HR, customer support, security, legal, everything you could imagine. And in a world where there'd be no technology disruption, though, that would be the whole company. But in a world of technology of disruption, we need to have some zones devoted to the disruptive side, to the, the, to the next wave, if you will. And we divide that into two chunks, what we call the incubation zone and the transformation zone. So the incubation zone, as you might imagine, is where you want to get started on these things. It looks a lot like an incubator. It should be managed somewhat like a VC portfolio, kind of startups, milestone funding, uh, very clear objectives, that kind of stuff. And, and then the transformation zone is used when you need to take, a, take one of these small businesses to scale. And to do that, it requires a financial commitment, which you don't have enough resources to fund. This is the big challenge of the, of the large corporation. There's no way it can maintain its financial performance profile and catch the next wave. And sometimes it's catching the next wave at trying to get ahead of the game. So it incubated the disruption. But frankly, more often, it's trying to catch up to some other disruptor who is disrupting it. And so they have to take a business out of the performance zone, put it into the transformation zone, transform it to all the new technology, and then put it back in the performance zone. So the transformation zone has got a lot of work to do uh, when, it, when it's activated. Hopefully, you don't activate it very often. Right. And, and as you talk about it in the book, you, I mean, you really detail out just what a sacrifice this is, right? I mean, you talk about the, a principle, principle in transformation is that completing that shift is actually more important than making your number. So on a financial level, but also it seems like on a psychic emotional level that the, the sacrifice here is enormous. It is enormous, and particularly for if you think about a large established enterprise, it 
prides itself on having made the number quarter after quarter after quarter, meeting investor expectations. That's where our stock price is. We have performance stock grants to our executives in order to support this effort, et cetera, et cetera. So making the number has a, has, has a tendency to become a sacred commitment. And it turns out in a transformation, you have to sacrifice that commitment. And by the way, you get criticized for it. And your investor, many of your investors desert you. But if you don't make that commitment, you don't put enough resources behind catching the next wave, you have this horrible outcome of getting halfway into these transformations, not having enough resource to get all the way through. So side sidetracking or pausing or hitting the pause button, whatever you want to call it, but basically falling back into the status quo is what happens. And that turns out to be the most destructive thing you can do to a company. And that's why there's that, those 56 books uh, companies mentioned at the beginning of the book, which don't exist anymore, because that's what they did over and over again until, until frankly, they had no company left. Right. So in essence, they failed to make this enormous energetic sacrifice, this enormous push to, to make it through to the other side and develop this new offering in, in the sector that's being disrupted, right? In the environment where they're being disrupted. Exactly. And, and if you think about a couple of things that they, they typically did wrong, one is since they weren't sure which disruption to back, they actually tried to back more than one at the same time, which if you can imagine, that even makes the resource equation worse. Uh, and, and, and then secondly, no matter what else they did, at the end of the day, they always insisted on making their number in the current quarter which was which meant that they never could get enough resources behind the new thing. And it, it, it's really a huge ask because the new business is inefficient, it's ineffective, you don't really have a good ecosystem yet, your customers aren't really sure they want you even to be here. I mean, it, there's a lot of doubters behind you. And so it's not a, it shouldn't be surprising that most companies actually never do catch the next wave. Right, and so in your experience then, what... <laughs> I suppose there are a number of factors here, but maybe let's start, given this is being human, let's start on the, the, the people element here. What are the characteristics of those leaders who, who make it through to the other side and transform their organizations? Well, you know, this is what, they, and this is why I was delighted to be on the, on the podcast, because each of the four zones celebrates a different dimension of the human character. So let me start with the other zones first. So the performance zone supports that sort of achievement-oriented in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the people that want to be the achievers, the people that say, we're going to win, we're going to compete, we're going to compete against the best, and we're going to be the best. And so they, they want to make the number, and they, they get up every morning to do that. And if we didn't have those folks running out in front of our companies, we wouldn't exist. So that's an incredibly important uh, uh, culture. The culture of the productivity zone is much more supportive. It's much more of a collaborative culture. It's much more putting itself in service to others as opposed to the more egocentric performance culture. And, and, and so it, it has a culture of, of giving and, and supporting and wanting to be part of a team and, and kind of doing the best. Kind of every day I want to put myself in service to the world in the best way I possibly can. And, and that's just for people for the for the productivity zone. Then, so this would be typically within a company. What would we be talking about in terms of well, we, so this would be this would be your customer support people, your marketing people, your finance people, your HR people, your IT people, legal. I mean, so these people have a commitment to their own profession and their own professional standards. But at the end of the day, their job is to be in service to the company as a whole and, and to the performance of the company. And, and th those two zones kind of can, can kind of have a tug of war with each other because in the performance zone, you're going, well, gosh, I've got to get this thing done. And I mean, I know you have processes, but come on, I've got to get it done now. And the, and the productivity zone believes that process really is the solution to everything. So everybody should always follow the process. But in fact, in the performance zone, that doesn't really work. And so, but, but th those two zones have known each other for a long time. And, and, and it's important that they honor each other. So if the performance zone does not honor the productivity zone, you get Uber, you get, you get these companies that have gone off, you get WeWork, you get these companies that have just gone off the rails, okay? If the productivity zone does not honor the performance zone, you get these sort of financially tired organizations that sort of slowly shrink their way to extinction because they run the process every quarter and they don't take any risks and they go, they go sideways. So it's important that both zones honor each other. Now, the incubation zone is much more of a startup Y Combinator 
We don't need no stinking processes. You know, we're the smartest people in the room. You know, we are inventing the future. Just get out of our way. Fund us, of course. You know, but, but other than that, leave us alone. And of course, that needs a discipline of, no, no we're not going to leave you alone, but we are going to hold you accountable to startup metrics, not to performance zone metrics, and not to productivity zone processes. You have your own, you have your own accountability. So that's kind of entrepreneurial, creativity cultures, very intuitive, fast fail, be agile, all that kind of stuff. Uh, by the way, if you're, if you're fast failing in the performance zone, you're probably going to get fired. And if you fast fail in the productivity zone, you might actually have to go to jail. So, so each zone, in other words, has a legitimate claim to a different kind of culture. So those three cultures exist in most companies, but the transformation zone is where you have to make this extraordinary sacrifice. And really, only the CEO can lead that because only the CEO has really corporate permission to require the rest of the company to reallocate their resources in a way that is just not normal. And frankly, it's going to be uh, it's going to be rejected by many people in the community. It's not even the right thing to do. But but so the, so the winners in that, the classic people who have done well in the transformation zone have been the founders, you know, who have these really strong, both they have a strong position in, in the company. They have charisma. They often have a lot of stock. They often have influence over the board. And they just sort of say, my way or the highway. And so it, it's a Steve Jobs. It's an Elon Musk. It's a Reed Hastings. It, it's, it, it's a Mark Benioff. It's Larry Ellison, Bill Gates these people who have been able to say, we are going to do this no matter what. Hewlett pa David Packard and, 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 Bob, and uh, Bill Hewlett did that at Hewlett Packard back in the day, uh, and, and, and whatever. But the, the, the companies that struggle in that zone are the ones who have management teams that have been hired long after the founder may be gone, maybe in some cases may be passed away. And, and they've been hired to essentially manage for shareholder value managed for stakeholder value. And at some point, the, the, this, this financial sacrifice just looks wrong. And they don't, frankly, have the, the, the same kind of charismatic power base that the founder had. And so it's just much harder to do. Right. And, and that's important, isn't it? And I'm just thinking the context of Jamie Dimon and the recent business uh, roundtable where they agreed not to, not to put shareholder value at the top of the list of products. I mean, do, do you see that as, as a link here as we enter an age where transformation is um, more of a requisite for companies as they move forward? I think, I think there's two things going on. I think that is part of it. I think also we're entering an age where there's a surplus of capital. And in an age where there's a surplus of capital, the shareholder is no longer the scarce ingredient in the equation. The customer has become the scarce ingredient in the equation. And, and, and also, to some degree, the community and the ecosystem are becoming they'll be able to assert their rights because frankly, the investors had a stranglehold on the board's attention. And it was, by the way, it was not healthy. Peter Drucker wrote about this 40 years ago. He said that the stakeholders that Jamie called out were the same stakeholders Peter called out 40 years ago. But, and we said, you know, there was investors, customers, employees, communities, partners, and all five of them we should be, you know, we should honor our relationships with. What happened during the 80s and 90s with this massive global industrialization was capital was the scarce ingredient. And so therefore we over-rotated to the investment community and we did everything we could to get as much capital into the system as fast as possible, needless to say with some bumps in the road to say the least. Uh, but, but, but we did. I mean, and, and, and by the way, by and large, that industrial thing worked. But now we're to, I would say post-industrial, but we're past the the inflection point with industrialization, global industrialization. So I think we're resetting priorities now. Right. And what, and what are some of these new priorities that you see emerging for companies that they need to embrace? Well, I mean, so it's really interesting. I mean, in addition to this customer, so you've seen an enormous amount about customer first now. So the whole customer, instead of talking about customer support, people are now talking about customer success management. That's a big, that's becoming a much bigger function. Uh, just this whole idea of the customer experience has become a much bigger issue for people. Uh, but, but, but in addition, the employee experience, people are realizing that talent is part of the game. And then because of the next generation of employees saying, look, we don't share this capitalist value, this over rotation to the capital thing. We have other values as well. And so you hear people like Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce saying, Business is the best platform for social change. It's better than government. It's better than NGOs. But you have to use it for that. You can't just you can't just sort of 
talk it, you have to actually do it. Uh, but I think I think all of those forces are moving toward a a rebalancing of priorities. Right, and, and that's interesting because as I read the book, <laughs> the question in my mind became, well, okay, so we we have a transformation which allows us to take one of the bets, and that's your the important pay, point you make, right? Just one bet from the yeah. incubation zone, and then you put all of the well, all of the focus and the priority on scaling that up. Um, but then ultimately, it, that transitions into the performance get, performance zone. So, but my question was, that's then embracing this metaphor of the, the sports metaphor, the domination. Let's beat the competition. Is that at odds with some of the emerging values for for businesses in terms of well, that it's not really about beating the competition; it's about fulfilling our purpose and so on. I, 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 I don't. I, I think it still has to be competitive, but I think we might argue about what we're competing for. So it's maybe we're competing for more social goods or more, or you're still competing at least for the attention of the marketplace. And I think you're, you're, you're competing for the cash flow of the world. I mean, you still want your cash to go through your, 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 your enterprise. Uh, I don't think you're competing to build the biggest war chest as much as, as that, you, that. Maybe I would argue that. And, but I still think you need the, 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 the because, because business, I think, is Darwinian in an appropriate way. Darwinism helps weed out weaker businesses and improve better businesses. I think I think everybody is uh, uh, benefits from that sort of Darwinian competition. So you need a, comp- a competitive force, but it should that zone. One of the con- things we, we've talked a lot about when we're talking with advising with companies, every zone has to honor the other three zones, and the performance zone is sort of famous for not doing that. It's it's famous for sort of trying to dictate terms to the other three zones, and that's inappropriate. That 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 is wrong. Right, and I guess the, your examples from earlier, Uber, uh, maybe we work where it's all about winning, right? And it, to the yeah, or well, look at or look at the off. horrible financial look at the financial crisis of two thousand and eight. That was a place where the performance zone ran rampant over everything, and not by the way, not only over its own internal productivity zone, they ran rampant over all the government control. I mean, the, 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 the way the UK government and the US government capitulated to the financial community is a travesty. And, and, and you know, and, and by the way, the way that, frankly, we've capitulated to the technology community is approaching travesty, although I think the world this time is pushing back harder and faster. That's interesting. So, but well, maybe let's dig into that a little bit. So how do, how do you think we may have capitulated to the to the tech center, uh, tech, uh, tech world as a society? Yeah, I, I think we, I mean, and by the way, I was, a, I mean, I, I have to be, I'm sort of advocating for the capitulation, so I have to be clear here, uh, because I think you see, what you see with new technologies, you do want to let the horses run, because you don't know where they're going, and you need to, you need to, so there's a certain amount of libertarian, you know, let, let the world find it. Facebook, I think, is a canonical example. I think Facebook was a very good thing until it stopped being a very good thing. But I don't think we could have predicted what happened. I sure as couldn't predict what happened with, say, Facebook. But now that we see what's happened with Facebook, now we have to now. Now what will happen is the world will say, OK, we need to establish regulatory controls here because this is not appropriate. But 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 you, I don't th- I don't think you'd say, well, we should have known better and we should have stopped it sooner. I don't think that's I don't think that's realistic. And I think it's bet. I mean, better. But I think I think it is more reasonable to say, okay, let it run. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, now I see why we should be careful. But and, and then try to correct it uh, afterward. So I'm almost seeing that there's there's the what's emerging for me is there's the idea of a productivity zone within a within an organization, and that's job that's job. Its job is to hold to a certain set of professional values, but also in the, in the wider society, we need something like that to. To run counter to the, the sort of rampant uh, yeah. capitalization, cap, capitalism, I suppose you might say. And, and well, I would argue that in a Western liberal democracy, that is the function of government. The government is, is almost exclusively in the productivity zone. You don't really expect government to be in the performance zone. In a socialist economy, you might, or in a communist economy, you certainly would. So China has the government much more in the performance zone than, say, you know, your your nation or mine. Uh, so, but the, so that's a kind of a political choice. Uh, the, the one thing I think has been a bit naive by the public sector is I think the public sector thinks it has a role to play in the incubation zone. It's terrible, the incubation zone. It's just really bad. 
I mean, it just, I mean, God bless. I, I, it's very generous, but it's just, no, that's not how it works. So that's the one where I would be careful with it. <laughs> right. But you, yeah, okay. But you still very much see there a role for government in the productivity zone and not handing that over to NGOs or nonprofits in a more libertarian no, it's, sense? No, that's an interesting question. So, by the way, I think NGOs often could do quite well in the incubation zone, by the way, because they have that sort of try to do the next thing, do the right thing. I do think that the, the issue, so I'm writing a book, uh, actually, I'm going to write it, uh, well, I finished a manuscript, we'll see if it gets published, because it's my first book that's not about business. It's, 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 it's called A Strategy for Living, Metaphysics and Ethics for the 21st Century. So needless to say, it may not be a bestseller uh, in, in the business community, but in that thing, we're talking about, about one place we're talking about is social justice and, and what is the role of, of government in social justice. And when you look at that, and you look at the welfare state as it emerged and then as we've tried to modify it, there's some ch fundamental challenges when the government tries to act out a mission of social justice because, because it's a bureaucratic structure, because it has to put in place, well, it, it has a tra tradition of putting in place bureaucratic controls to prevent fraud, to prevent abuse, et cetera, et cetera. The amount of dollars that you can get through to the end purpose in a bureaucratic system is not very large, and, and unfortunately, it doesn't scale very well. So it's both inefficient and, 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 and to some degree ineffective because it tends to be top down. It doesn't, doesn't tend to get power out to the edge. We tend to feed the bureaucrats more than we feed the teachers, or we tend to feed the hospital administrators more than we feed the doctors. I mean, it's a mistake. We've we got to figure out a better way to do it. But, but right now, you look at those things and you say, well, there's, a, there's this kind of a crisis of financial viability and, and responsiveness. And, it, and it's not like the people in those jobs aren't trying to do it, but it's just a tough structure. So this is when, when, when Benioff and other people say business is the best platform for change, I think what they're saying is we have more freedom than they do. Now, we can, we can be free to just keep all the money to ourselves, or we can be free to actually be agents for social change, but we have more freedom of movement, at least at the beginning. Now, you have to, it's got to be a private, private public partnership. It, you, can't, you can't, again, you have to honor the other zone, but, but you, can, you can operate under your, 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 under your own steam. Right. So you're not full scale libertarian. You still see a role for the state. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think it's really important. I, I, I think that the state without libertarianism ends up, it, it's like a productivity zone with no performance zone. That, so that's, that's not good. Uh, that, and, and if you have a performance zone without productivity zone, that's not good. So obviously, we have to honor, find some way to honor the both zones. Right, right. We started talking about the, the qualities of the leader of transformation. I just wonder if we could touch back on that a little bit, because it, it does fast. So there's a couple of things that, that I took out of this. So one was yeah, this, the importance of it being led from the top, um, the importance of this particular character who's going to see this through, and quite often it may be the founder, but they have to have that, the, the right mindset. Very often they're the founder. Talk a little bit about this idea of it just being one thing. I thought that was a very important point. Right. Well, and this, by the way, you know, Steve Jobs taught us many lessons, but this is one. So when, when, when Steve uh, would say Apple's about one thing, so when, when he had the Macintosh and that was all he had, he invented the iPod and then he got iTunes. And then from then on, every advertisement you saw from Apple was about iTunes and about the iPod and you know, these little silhouettes of people with white strings coming out of their ears. And, and if you went into an Apple store, it was all iPod until you got to the very back of the store. Now, mind you, 100% and more of the revenue and profit or the profit of the company was coming from Macintoshes. You didn't hear a word about that. You only heard about the music. And, and then he, he had a version of the iPhone. Well, actually, Motorola built a, a kind of a, 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 phone, a, a music phone in collaboration with the iPod. But he had versions internally, but he didn't release them until the, I, the music business was well and totally established. Then you heard about the iPhone in 2007. Well, from then on, you never heard about the iPod. I mean, n nothing. I mean, it was like, well, where'd it go? And, and it was all iPhone, 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 iPhone. And by the way, he had the iPad well before the, the iPhone thing, but you didn't hear about the iPad until the very last two years of his life. He launched the iPad, I think, in the last year of his life. So the point was that was that one thing at a time because you, if to get it to scale, to keep the momentum behind it, if you have two things, they're just, there's, it's very hard to do it with one, 
And it's literally impossible to do it with two or more. But, but, the, but the average management team was saying, well, we don't know which one. We're not sure. This executive vice president has a horse in the race, but so does this other one. I can't really tell each one. They've got to take their horse out of the race. And the answer is, yes, you do. <laughs> but that's the job of a CEO. And, and I, think, I, think the CEO, I think the CEO job is wildly overcompensated unless they do this one thing, in which case it's actually undercompensated. So, <laughs> but, but it does, but, but it take, and so what it takes, I think, is the courage to say, look, part of the courage is maybe we shouldn't do it at all, because maybe we do not have a coalition of the willing, in which case, let's not start a war that we can't finish, right? But if we're going to start it, then by God, we're going to finish it. And, and my view is you've got to get past the tipping point within a couple of years or the world will, will give up on you. So it, it, you, and like every day in the transformation zone is a bad day. You're trying to get out of that zone as fast as you can. And what you're doing is jamming a business into the performance zone before it's really ready. And so then you're telling everybody in the other three zones, I don't care, make it work, make sac whatever sacrifice, just make it work. And that's what these people were able to do. Right, and, and, and the, so it's important here for the followers to get on board with this, that they've got to be willing. They've got to be willing to make the sacrifice themselves in their functions, in their areas, to accept this prioritization of this, this new line of business that we're taking through the transformation zone. So it's really important the CEO plays this role, but also that there's a followership there, right? Well, yeah, and the followership is also a pruning exercise because there will be people who will not follow and they have to be asked to leave now. So you, you, because if you leave any executive, and there's always, always at least one and often more than one executive who say, no, wait a minute, you know, I, I got us here. I, I mean, you, no, I'm not, I know my priorities. You're wrong. I'm right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manage my priorities. And the answer is, well, not in this company any longer. So, so, and the current, that, that's a really tough ask for the CEO. This is a person who typically has made, put the CEO in power. You know, this is part of their team, right? And but if if you do not do that, if you allow any executive, not even to resist, just to opt out, you, they can't even opt out because that gives every person in their organization permission to opt out, and you need all those people rowing in the same direction. And so, if you look at the like the transformation that Satya was leading at Microsoft, or you look at what you know what Mark was doing at Salesforce. The number of executive transitions during the transformation period is extraordinary. I mean, like an incredibly high level people, and they're not being fired for incompetence. They're being fired to say, look, for this next part of the journey, you're, you're, you've, you who have been our leader have become an obstacle. And so, and the courage, and the CEO having the courage to do that, and to do it with dignity, that, that's, that's a real big ask. And I mean, I think both Satya and Mark are exemplary in the way they handle themselves, but it's a big ask. Right. But it might be useful for you to elaborate on either of those examples. I thought, I thought, I thought they were great reading them. Into what was the shift that those leaders made and, and what, did, what, did they, you know, what journey did they take their companies on? Well, okay. So let's start with, with I think, the more dramatic one because I, I think both you know, the disruption at Salesforce was, was big. They brought in marketing cloud uh, in, where service and, serve, and sales cloud was. At the same time, Mark brought in Keith Block from Oracle to, because they needed to move from more of a mid-market focused business to an enterprise, global enterprise business. And so both of those things were happening at the same time. They were bringing marketing cloud into their portfolio and they were kind of up leveling their game to go from a $2 billion a year company five years ago to a $20 billion company this year. So I mean, extraordinary, I mean, an order of magnitude uh, <coughs> growth uh, and, and very disruptive. And in that process, virtually every direct report of Mark has been replaced at some point during that journey. Not for incompetence, but in that case, largely because you can't ask somebody to lead the next part of the journey if they've never been there before. And many of the people in role had, had, had actually driven Salesforce to 2 billion, but in so doing, obviously they were not at 20, they were driving it to two. And, and so uh, uh, there was need for new help. What Satya was doing at Microsoft was I think more common in my advisory practice. Microsoft was not the disruptor, they were the disruptee. Uh, the, the mobile systems were disrupting Windows with the operating system. Uh, Office was being disrupted by the Google apps for free. 
And the back office software, which was the business that Satya ran, was being interrupted by, uh, disrupted by cloud. So Satya led this, 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 this agenda. And by the way, he was backed by Balmer. Balmer doesn't get any credit for this, but he should. Because Satya said in 2007, I think how long ago that was, I will no longer fund R&D unless it is for the cloud. And they had this huge $9 billion, incredibly profitable back office software business. He said, yeah, I'm not putting any more new R&D into that business. Well, you can imagine the brouhaha that that created, mm. particularly because Microsoft has a very competition-oriented culture, lots of tribal chieftains, you know, looks, you know, lot, you know very, very, uh, um, you know, sort of entitlement, a lot of entitlement. So a whole bunch of people had, had, to, had to move on. But they went through an extraordinary thing where they were They were saying, let's replace our back office software business in every possible account we can with cloud business. But understand that our back office software business has probably 90% net margins and our cloud business has negative gross margins. So just understand the, the financial implications of that. And I want to move all of our business to cloud. And, and by the way, halfway through, the, the uh, Satya asked, and Balmer agreed, and the head of sales was a guy named KT agreed, to double compensate you for selling the negative gross margin business in place of the 90% net margin business. So, I mean, now, admittedly, they had quite a big war chest in the background, but still, that, was a, that, that, that looked pretty dumb to Wall Street for a while until it looked brilliant. Uh, and, and, then, and, the, and now, of course, the, you know, it's the basis of their stock price. Right, and so that's just a great example. It's one thing, it's cloud. Um, I mean, there's the, uh, the Andrew Carnegie quote, um, put all of your eggs in, eggs in one basket, but watch, watch the basket, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. well, I, I love that quote. I, the, the, what I was trying to do at the time, I like his quote better, is I, you know, people say, well, why can't we do two at the same time? And I said, well, you know, when a chicken tries to lay two eggs at the same time, it's bad for the eggs and it's bad for the chickens. <laughs> so, one egg at a time. <laughs> same, same idea. <laughs> right, right. And, and then you mentioned the J-curve. Um, yeah, so the, the, the J-curve is just, it's just the, it, it, it's something that we, we talk about in venture capital all the time. Because if you look at a startup, they say, yes, please give me a bunch of money. I'm not giving any of it back. By the way, if I'm successful at my milestone, I want to give you, you to give me some more money, and I'm not giving any of that back either. And we're not going to show a profit maybe for five years, although you'll see a lot of signs that say we could give you a profit if you wanted us to. But of course, the venture person says, no, no, put the money back into growth. Go, 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 go. Now, all of that's a J curve, meaning your finances go down, 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 down. Then they start to turn up, but they're still below, they're still losing money, losing money, losing money. And then when you sort of jump out, you, you, you have this sort of meteoric rise, that, 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 then that's the model for, for venture capital. Well, th th by the way, all the venture capital is organized around that model. So the limited partners who give money to venture capitalists, that's what they want them to do with it. The venture capitalists say, this is all we do with it. You know, they know how to manage through the J-curve. The whole system is set up to manage through a J-curve. Now you go into a public company. Public companies do not have venture capital behind them. They don't have, the, the, their investors are saying, no, we're an earnings oriented. Uh, we want to see earnings. We want to see profits. We don't want to see J-curves. And so all of a sudden you have this, this, and I'm trying to fund, and what the mistake companies make, I think, is they say, well, we can get through this J-curve, but we can still perform well enough to keep our investors happy. And the answer is, no, you can't. No, that's not true. So, so don't, don't go, if, if either, either keep your investors happy and don't go through the J-curve and, and buy time, and maybe at some later date, you, you'll, you'll have the coalition of the willing. But if you don't now, don't do it. Or if you're going to do it, then A, do it as fast as possible and be as explicit as possible about what you're doing. Let everybody know what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then just do it. But you got to get everybody on that page. Right. And, and that comes up for me. I mean, you've, you've described it in financial terms there, but I think the corollary is in, in, in often in people's emotional experience of this, right? There's a level where there's this disruption, that there's a sense of denial, there's, a, there's entering some kind of depression. Uh, you know, and then, the five and then, stages. <laughs> exactly, yes, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. I can't. Catherine Kluber Ross, where are you? We need you on our board of directors. Yes, exactly. Well, but I just wonder if that comes up when you talk about this. That there's oh, a, there's oh, a, I'm sure it has to. I'm sure. So I think what, you, what we're really asking, and now it's more than just the CEO, it's now it's the whole executive team, is to say, look, P 
people can go through a crisis if they're oriented. What they can't do is, is, is deal with an inauthentic communication in the middle of a crisis. America right now is kind of going through this. Well, you guys are going through it too, right? I mean, we have, we have two governments who are, who are specializing in inauthentic communications at a time that's a crisis. And it's just like, this is not a very good idea. So, so to be successful, you, you really do need to, to unite the company around, around the change. And, and one of the ways that in a compensation-oriented culture, if you say part of the compensation is stock, one of the important things to realize about these transformations is if they're successful, your stock price should change dramatically. So there's, there's actually quite a large reward for getting through a, a, a transformation successfully. Uh, and, and, and that's worth keeping in mind. Having said that, the only zone that is truly compensation driven is the performance zone. The other three zones are not actually driven by compensation. So compensation alone will not unite your company. You really do have to have a narrative. And this is where I think that CEO, as, as, the, as the chief storyteller, you know, our, we, leave, we lead our lives in service to narratives. Now, there are, we have personal narratives, we have societal narratives, we have company narratives, we have family narratives. The, the CEO has got to articulate a narrative that the, the employees can unite behind, the, at least some of the customer base and some of the partner ecosystem can unite behind, at least some of the investor base can unite behind. A bunch of people will say, I'm, I'm not united behind this. And, th and then the CEO has to say, well, then maybe it's time for you to sell our stock, or maybe it's time for you to leave our ecosystem and work with a different partner, or leave this company and work with a different company, because this is where we're going. Right, and that's so important that ultimately people have to opt in, right? You have to give this, op this ability for people to leave, and the people who are with you are going to be opted in. Exactly. And, 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 you know, the truth is people want to opt in. I mean, people don't, people want to come to work and be bored. They don't want to come to work and be oppressed. You know, they, they'd like to actually come up to work and be self-realized. Uh, but, you know, you know, so it, I think, I think, I think that's, I worry about, when I think about the, the, the earlier conversation, I was thinking about France and what France is going through this week. And I'm thinking about, you people are thinking about work as some sort of entitlement, and you're not thinking about it as your life. You, you, you have no, you, you're not, you're, you're, it's like your life is based on what you do on vacation, and work is what you do to fund your vacation. And it's like, that's a crappy way to live. It's just not a good way to live. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was reflecting on as I read the book was, it, it seems to me that you're, you're talking about um, this as a playbook for a, you know, fairly centralized um, a sort of capital plan, right? A, a commercial organization which is relatively centra centralized. What do you make of these sort of emergent business model which look very different, you know, say like a Wikipedia or um, Ethereum or a blockchain, you know, or the, Bit the Bitcoin? organization where, where they're radically decentralized, there's no kind of central commercial entity as such. Do any of these ideas sort of play over into that? What do you make well, of that, that, this emerging model? So I, I, think, I think first a couple of things came, came to mind. So one is, by the way, this model can be used obviously at the corporate level. You can also, by the way, if you're in an enterprise, you could use it just for your own organization. In other words, you could say, inside my organization, I have a performance zone. That's, I do, even, if I, even if my org's in the productivity zone, I have a performance responsibility. If I have a, fi if I have a finance department, I'm supposed to deliver financial reports and you know, complete my financial obligations. So I have a performance zone. I have a productivity zone. I can invest in my own organization's productivity. I can, in do incubate, I can incubate some new ideas for my organization. And if necessary, I could say we're going to convert from the old system to the new system, and that would be a kind of a transformation. So you can imagine using it at an organization level, at a department level. You can even do it as a person. Say, well, how, am I investing in my own productivity? Am I incubating for my own future? Am I supposed to transform it? You could do that. Having said that, when you're talking about the organizations you're talking about, I think the question is when you have a decentralized operating model, there's still the issue is, power in the world or impact in the world. All of the organizations you mentioned, Wikipedia being a classic example, want to have impact in the world. So that is their performance zone. Now, if it's a highly decentralized zone, it's, yeah, it's, it's a whole competition culture thing. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not the way that, uh, that model works. But you still want to say, okay, but am I investing in executing against my current power capability 
I'd call that your performance zone. Am I investing in making that more productive? Okay, that'd be my productivity zone. Or am I experimenting with new operating models? Okay, that would be my that would be my incubation zone, et cetera. So I think you can still use the zone thinking around resource allocation, because at the end of the day, we we all have a limited amount of resources, and we, you know where are we going to put them to have the most impact? Right. So I, I can see there that the, so the, the the same questions might be relevant. It just may be that where the decisions get made and who are asking them might be slightly different, right? It may be that a network is still dwelling in some of these inquiries. It's, it's just happening in a, in a different way, potentially. I, and I, I do think this. I think that narrative is even more, the more decentralized the organization, the more important narrative is, is for providing the cohesion and the coherence of the activity. Because if I know the story, we can all act out the story in our own independent ways. And, and I, can, I can be free to, to be act with a lot of uh, empowerment at the edge. If I don't know the story, I have to take command and control orders, and that, that reverts to a hierarchy and it reverts to a, a much more hierarchical organization, a much more centralized organization. Right. So the storytelling is still going to be very uh, important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And, and how those emerge across the network. Um, but it is because it, the other thing that comes up. Is it the case, though, that for these more centralized organizations, it almost requires these somehow almost superhuman efforts to make the transformation? But if we have more decentralized organizations in the first place, are they sort of better equipped um, sort of fundamentally to deal with disruptions than the more centralized organization? You know, I, I, possibly, but my, my instinct is that what will happen is if they're not careful, they'll diffuse all their energy before it gets to critical mass. So I think it's easier for them to start because there's less inertial resistance to starting. But, but it's, I think it takes, you think about how much orchestration it's going to take for it to get to a coherent, sustainable rhythm long term. That's where I think the challenge would be. Um, uh, and I just, I, I, I don't have enough experience with organizations to, 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 to say more than that. I just, that's what I would watch for. Right. But, and cause, cause it's the question in my mind, cause, cause I've had a lot of people on this show who talk about these, sort of this, this radical, radically new way to organize businesses. And there are some examples of, of them much, much flatter organizations, um, um small, a, a network of small in entities and, and so on. And, but I'm left with the question, okay, but why is it that some of these centralized commercial entities still dominate the world and are still having such huge impact? Yeah, there must yeah. be something in their model which is giving them an advantage today, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, mean, I think for, for one thing, to the degree that capital is still part of the game, I think they're much better at acquiring and, and sustaining capital funding and, and doing all of that. I think, but we may not be evaluating this thing properly. So, I, you know, if you look at the reading in, so I periodically, I get this magazine called Monocle. I think it comes out of the UK. It's, it, it's, it's a lifestyle magazine for, I think, the millennial community. And when it celebrates an issue after issue after issue is boutique anything, boutique retail, boutique service business, whatever. And, and what they're you know, typically around food and around hospitality and around, you know, sharing experiences. And so you're looking at that and you're saying, you know, this is a generation saying there is power in this framework. There's power in this decentralized world. It's not the power to act in a centralized way. So don't compare our power to a nation states or a corporations, but, but it's soft. And they keep on talking about soft power. And, and you start thinking about, well, this, there's an ideal. There's a kind of a, almost like a, it's almost like a pastoral ideal. Like, like let's, let's flee the urban, you know, crazy Silicon Valley concentrated bang, bang, bang financial community. And let's reestablish a, a more natural rhythm of life where we're more united as a human community. We're not so divisive. We're not so, you know, we're not so ambitious. We're not so selfish. We're not so greedy. You know, we're not so afraid of death. We're not so afraid of all this stuff. We're, we'd like to lead a more grounded world. And I think that's a lot of what I'm hearing. I don't think the decentralized model is going to be more powerful than the centralized model in terms of the power, the way, if you define power the way the centralized model defines it. I think it's going to always be the most powerful at that. But it may be, a, a, and I think it is going to be an interesting alternative for the next you know, number of decades. I think there's going to be more life 
time, more people are going to want to invest more of their life in that framework to see where it goes. Uh, whereas in my generation, I think it was more about come to the city, come to the centralized enterprise, pursue your career that way. I think that we're now saying, eh, how about if we went the other way for a while and see what happens? Right. So what I'm hearing there is that these, these other models may provide people with a slightly different lifestyle, but we can't expect them to compete in the same way or, or compare them in the same way to what these centralized commercial entities can achieve in the world. Yeah. In fact, if you look at the value system of those lifestyles, they say, look, we're not as materialistic. We don't need as much. We don't need to consume as much. If you look at the, at the centralized model, it's designed to maximize consumption. Well, we're looking at the planet right now going, that may not be the best strategy, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so maybe we need to rethink how we're organized. <laughs> but does that not, well, okay, so does that not leave you sometimes with the question is like, oh, should I really be helping these organizations to be? It's a fair. It's a fair question. My my. By the way, I'm an ex. I started off as an English professor, so I'm a liberal arts teacher, and my 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 bias is very much toward the, some of these values I've been articulating. You know, I the way I've thought about it is I thought you know these are engines of employment. These are engines of national wealth and national development. Um, I'm good at supporting them. I'm good at advising them. So I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And, and but I definitely. Um, it's kind of neat because at this point in my career, I get to work with the companies kind of I want to, and I don't have to work with the companies I don't want to. What I've discovered about myself is that I end up, and by the way, it's, it's mutually selective. I end up working with collaboration cultures and not working with competition culture. And, and so uh, and that, that so the collaboration cultures, I think, have this sense of social good being, being not just a lip service, not just lip service, but actually integral to their being and their success. Whereas I think competition cultures see social giving as a tax or, you know, a, an afterthought or, or a secondary, an, epiph an epiphenomenon, not part of the phenomenon. And, I, and I, think it, I think it needs to be more integrated than that. Right. And actually you called out, is it Joseph Parker that, at Salesforce who you said made oh, the Parker synthesis? Harris? Parker, Parker Harris. Harris, sorry. Parker yeah, Harris, right. who made the synthesis between competition and collaboration that, particularly struck you? What, what, what was it about yeah, his well, style? Yeah, which, what, yeah, what you see is that, and, and there's, you also see this on great athletic teams. We have this wonderful basketball team in the Bay Area called the Golden State Warriors who are struggling this year because they've had a bunch of injuries. But for five years, they were just this extraordinary team because they were so good at teamwork. They were so good at, at not emphasizing their own stats and making the, the, the teamwork. So Parker and Mark were interesting. So Parker would continually advocate for the productivity zone at a time when Mark was continually advocating for the other three zones. I mean, Mark is basically an incubation transformation performance guy and Parker is largely, you know, was, and now they've got more, he's got a lot of help now, but there was a time when Parker was the champion of the productivity zone. And so that was great. I mean, and, and they honored each other. Again, what was so cool about that leadership team was highly different personas honored each other and honored each other's zones. And, and uh, that, and by the way, Hewlett Packard, same way. Uh, very similar cultures, very similar sense of competition. And, and the idea was compete through collaborating, collaborate in order to effectively more compete. Whereas the other kinds of works are amazing. If you look at the success of the 90s, if you look at, if you look at the success at Microsoft, at Intel, at Oracle, at Cisco, at Sun, these were very, very competition-oriented cultures and very ego I don't know if they're egocentric, but they were, they were egoistical. They, it, ego was, was the clear operative force. And, 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 not, and, and not in a bad sense. It, e ego, you know, putting its will on the line to accomplish something. Very competitive ego. Um, but uh, but that, those cultures and I, we, I don't have much to give them, and I don't think they have much interest in me. <laughs> oh, it works fine. <laughs> yeah. And, and interesting to reflect on one of the most... Uh, successful organizations in the world today, Salesforce uh, is incorporating this, these values that you, that, that you are attuned to. So that's encouraging. Yeah, it's, to it's, it's, really an honor. it's really an honor to be working with them. And actually all my clients right now, the ones I'm working with, I just, I'm really honored because, you know, it, business is hard. I mean, and, and, and when you do it in a collaborative style, it's maybe even a little harder. Uh, but, but anyway, it's good. Uh, before we close this out, I had a, a personal question for you. I mean, I was struck by the fact you're in your 70s now. You've, you've just published a new book. You're telling me you're writing another book. 
how is it that you you stay so productive uh yeah th- at this stage i mean was, yeah, was, it's funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah um well a couple of, so i i, I, I have to get a bunch of credit Marie, my wife and i started meditating like back when we were first married so 50 years ago we, we started transcendental meditation and that's been really helpful because it you know on airplanes wherever you are you know you kind of chill out. you can just take the stress out of your system but the other thing is i don't have anybody reporting to me you know i, I mean this is not this is not bad <laughs> uh, and by the way i don't know who invented the speaking business but whoever invented the speaking business said you always have to fly first class and be limoed everywhere. So that's not too bad either, by the way. And then if you say, well, advisory fees, well, McKinsey would charge a million dollars a month. So whatever I charge, it can't be that much. So that's pretty good. So, so and, I, and, and to be fair, as the writing part, I, as I said, I, I was an English professor. I, I will write, I will probably, you know, expire with a pen in my hand. Or, or at least a keyboard on my lap because I love writing. So I'm doing this stuff I love. And that when you're doing this stuff you love, it really isn't work. I mean, it just, it just isn't. Uh, you, you, as long as you're kind of moving, letting sort of life flow through you as opposed to, as opposed to sort of grinding it out. And so I'm, I've not been grinding it out for a long time. Right. That reminds me of a Steve Jobs quote. He it, 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 it says, uh, find what you love. And if you haven't found it yet, keep, keep looking, right? That's like, <laughs> job it's number so, one. It's so true. You know, when you're doing what you love, I mean, you you just do it. I mean, it's, it's like it's, you see these musicians who are obviously love what they're doing, or, or uh, well, you, uh, you love what you're doing, you know. And 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 it's just you know, it's it's not work. I mean, it's 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 lucrative, but it's not work. <laughs> right. And the meditation helps as well. It sounds like. Oh yeah, no, it really it, it's it's a gift. Yeah, I mean that that's when I would I would hope this, they, they call it mindfulness is a more generic term for it these days, but. But I just, I, every time you see it show up, it's like, man, it, it can't hurt. And it, well, for example, Salesforce, Salesforce has kind of gone a little bit all in on that. Every floor in Salesforce Tower has a meditation room. And, and the idea is to use it, not, not, not just have yeah, it. Well, it doesn't get used is the question. <laughs> yeah, no, it does get used. When, at, at executive off-sites, monks come and lead meditations. I mean, it, during the off-site, it's pretty good. Anyway. Right. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's... <laughs> That's good. That's great. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation. So energizing. Uh, well, my yeah. pleasure. I, my, I enjoyed it myself, and I'm glad I had a chance to be on your show. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get the links out to the book. I'll put it up on the screen now. So this is uh, Zone Zone to Win. Thoroughly recommend it. Uh, we'll put we'll put the links out to that, and of course uh, the classic uh, for which you're you're very well thank known, you. crossing the crossing the chasm, which I would also also recommend. Still extremely relevant. I know it's in its uh, third edition recently, right, with new examples. So, uh, yeah, and and your your personal website. Uh, yeah, you- it, 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 I think probably the, there's a website, jeffreyamore.com, and all that stuff's there. And then a LinkedIn blog, uh, which I think got about maybe 700,000 followers. So it's, 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 yeah, it's kind of where I, it's where I sort of publish. So it's, it's, it's where I like to be. Awesome. Okay. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, well, Richard, and, thank you. And enjoy the, re- the rest of your day. Thank you. Will do. Take care.